Hi there, I'm Christopher Albright, your church council chair, and I'm here for this week's weekly message. I wanted to ask of all of you to please continue to keep Pastor Doug and Dee in your prayers as they take some time away uh, following the loss of both of Pastor Doug's parents. I'm here to tell you this week in my message that prayer works something you may already know, and hopefully you do already know. But um, I want to thank you for all of your prayers, cards, acts of kindness uh, towards me and, and my family while I was in the hospital. And even since I've come home to sort of finish off uh, the remainder of my recuperation, I received wonderful care at the West Shore Hospital. And I'm very thankful to all of them for all that they all that they did for me. But getting back to prayer and specifically your prayers for me, I want to talk to you a little bit about the impact that that had on me. And it's not something that can be easily explained to someone, but for me, I look at Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 when it says, "And the peace of God which transcends all understanding. Brothers and sisters, I felt your prayers when I was in the hospital, and that is the closest thing I can find to really explain how it felt. I thank you for all of, all of that, uh, not only for me, but also for my family as well. Again, don't ever doubt the power of prayer. Now, just a couple of uh, announcements, a couple of things to go over with you. Um, if you do have any prayer requests, um, you can email them to Barb Hammaker uh, or to the church office. Uh, either one of them can handle uh, putting them on the prayer list. And uh, just one other, one other note on that. If you're not sure what to pray for or, or how, to, how to word it, don't worry about it. Just think of Romans 8, 26. It says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. So even if you don't have the words, just trust that your prayer will get to the right place. So anyways, um, reach out to, to Barb or to the church office, and they can, they can help you with your prayer requests. Again, keep Pastor Doug and Dee in your prayers this week. Um, there is no communion uh, coming up on the March 7th service, which is this Sunday. Uh, normally, communion is served on the first Sunday of the month, uh, but there will be other opportunities for us to commune together on later dates. Uh, one other, actually a couple other announcements. One of them, Mission Central, is holding an online auction uh, from March 4th through the 7th. Um, you can go to biddingowl.com slash mission central. Again, that's biddingowl.com slash mission central. There's a lot of amazing things uh, to be had there and a, and a great uh, mission that you can support. Um, upper Room devotionals are now available. The March-April Upper Room has arrived uh, and is available for you to pick up in the church lobby uh, so you can stop in and get your copy. The Lenten series, um, which is brought to you by Adam, Adam Hamilton, The Way, Walking in the Footsteps of Jesus, uh, is available in the church office. There are limited copies, so please uh, call ahead and make sure that there is a copy uh, before you stop by. Uh, it's a great way to follow along with the series and get the most out of the study. Um, Jeff Miller's Sunday School Group is also uh, uh, doing this. So if you'd like to be a part of the, the Sunday School class, you can uh, get a hold of Jeff or myself or the church office, uh, and we'll, we'll get you connected there. So thank you very much, and uh, I'd like to close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for when your Spirit intercedes on our behalf, even when we don't know what it is we ought to pray for. Thank you for guiding our prayers to the right places and helping those that need it the most. We pray for your, your healing hand. We pray for 
the world as it is as we deal with the pandemic. Lord, we pray that this, these vaccines are distributed as, as quickly as possible and to as many people as possible. Lord, we ask for your hand in all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, friends. whenever you have chosen to join us in this virtual worship experience. I'm Jolene Willis, the District Superintendent of the Altoona District, and it, it has been a joy to be the planner coordinator of this youth-led conference service. Um, we have a young youth and young adults from all across the Susquehanna Conference, and today it is a glimpse of who our church is. We are all disciples of Jesus Christ. And as we are living and growing as disciples, we spur each other on in this wonderful adventure of being disciples and making new disciples of Jesus Christ. We are the young. We are the old. We are the daughters, we are the sons, we are the prophets, we are the dreamers, <laughs> we are children of God, disciples of Jesus Christ. Today our theme is We Are Disciples. As disciples of Jesus Christ, and especially during Lent, we tend to focus on spiritual disciplines, particularly on prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Today we celebrate all the disciplines that which John Wesley described as means of grace, places where we encounter God and God's grace. As disciples of Jesus Christ we pray. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we give you thanks for this Lenten season. 
We give you thanks for the opportunity of joining worship with others all across the Susquehanna Conference of the United Methodist Church and beyond. Lord, lead us in worship today. Draw us closer to you and your grace. Reveal yourself to us that we might be your faithful followers. May we encounter you along the way of this linen journey. And may our hearts be prepared to journey with you to death that we may be risen to new life along the resurrection of Christ. Amen. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we praise God. We worship the Lord. When Jesus spoke to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. By becoming disciples of Jesus, we can shine the light to all those who are in the dark. Discipleship and faith threads all generations together into a beautiful tapestry for Christ. A tapestry that shows him the word of love and devotion to him.
as disciples of Jesus Christ, we read and study God's Word. Hear the words of Acts chapter 10, selected verses. Then Peter began to speak. I realize now how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. We are witnesses. Jesus commanded us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one whom God appointed. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of God. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we preach. We welcome Julia Berselli, a first-year Penn State student who is discerning a call to ministry as our speaker today. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me. As mentioned, I'm a freshman at Penn State, and if you know much about Penn State, you probably know our chant. You hear it in the stadium during football games, when you're on a tour of campus, and if you're just walking down the street. Someone yells, we are, and everyone else responds with, Penn State, and it's a way to show pride, and it's a way to show community. It's believed that the phrase originated in the late 1940s, when Penn State refused to play in the Cotton Bowl in the segregated Dallas without their two black players. There were rumors that Penn State was meeting with the team they were set to play, the Southern Methodist University, to discuss the possibility of potentially excluding their black players from the game. But team captain Steve Sully is believed to have said, we are Penn State, there will be no meetings. This chant is what unites all who call Penn State their team, their school, and their family. In the moment when someone yells, we are, you don't hesitate to see who yelled it. You just scream Penn State back with every single ounce of school pride in you. And sure, it's kind of just a habit now. It would be rude not to respond, and honestly, it's just fun. <laughs> But when the words were first spoken, that use of we made a very controversial statement. The inclusion of Wally Triplett and Dennis Hoggart, our two African-American players, was up for discussion. They were amazing athletes that contributed to the team, but to some, their skin color was more important than their participation. They were great for the team, but not all thought that they should be part of the team. Judgment and prejudice have always existed and will continue to influence humans far into the future. God recognized the danger of this sin which could potentially keep his community divided. And so he brought together two men. Their story was recorded in the Bible so that believers of every time and place could learn what God wants for his people. As we heard earlier in Acts 10, a Gentile named Cornelius was introduced. Despite his non-Jewish heritage, Cornelius and his family were described as devout, God-fearing individuals who were respected by the Jewish people. An angel went to Cornelius and told him to send for Peter, who was staying in a nearby land. Meanwhile, Peter had a vision of animals. Creatures were everywhere, and Peter was told to kill and eat them. He was appalled. Peter would never break Jewish custom and eat these impure, unclean creatures. To which the voice in the vision responded, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. So following that bizarre vision, Peter was told by the Holy Spirit that Cornelius's men were there and to go with them without a question. Cornelius had gathered together friends and relatives to welcome Peter and to learn from him. Trusting in the Lord, Peter broke Jewish law by visiting and associating himself with them. They were Gentiles. So when he went, he addressed the elephant in the room. He told them why he broke Jewish law and why he went to visit them. He said that God had told him not to call anyone impure or unclean. Just as the animals in his vision were clean because they were made so by God, these people were just as pure as the Jews. Both peoples were made in the image of God. And so Peter began to preach to them about Jesus. As he was doing so, the Holy Spirit descended on the Gentiles in the same way that it had descended on the Jews at Pentecost. They began speaking in tongues and praising the Lord. The Jewish men who were with Peter were amazed. The Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. Peter recognized then that the message he was tasked with sharing was unlike anything in history. 
This was not the way of salvation for the Jews. It was the way of salvation for the world. So then he says that there can be no objection to baptizing these Gentiles because they had received the Spirit. And with that action, Peter rejected the prejudice that would have kept him from doing his job as a disciple. In verse 34 and 35, Peter said to the Gentiles, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. This was such an important lesson that we must all learn from if we want to move forward and share God's message. And I think it's really important to note that the prejudice existed. Peter, who was taught by Jesus himself, given the honor of being the rock on which our church would be built, was surprised when men that weren't like himself could be granted the gift of eternal life. God knew that Peter would not have considered going to the Gentiles on his own. His nature and upbringing had led him to see them as unworthy of God's grace. He didn't hate them. He certainly didn't hate them, but he also didn't see them as spiritual equals. Peter was commissioned to make disciples of all nations, but he had forgotten that all actually meant everyone. And just as one of the most influential disciples in all of history held prejudices, so do we. Judgment based on generalizations often determines who we associate with and who we trust. Not just our close friends, but also strangers. You see a post on Facebook and assume you know everything about that person from that single post. Or the way the person behind you in line looks will likely determine if you start a conversation with them. For me, I noticed that this sin became way more enticing when I went to college. I was surrounded by a couple hundred brand new people with the task of finding a few close friends who I could really connect with. And it's daunting. God created all of us uniquely, and that means it takes a little bit of work to get to know someone. Whereas finding the people who look and act like myself is comfortable and easy. But in terms of spiritual growth, the easy thing is often not the right thing. Of course, I probably could have found some close friends in those groups of people that I generalized as similar to myself. But imagine all the friendships I would have lost if I ignored the people that didn't seem like the type of people I would get along with. Now imagine if instead of friendship, that thing lost as a result of prejudice was the life-changing gift of Jesus Christ. So what keeps you from interacting with people? What prejudices do you hold? I'm willing to bet it's something you're able to justify in your head. Your prejudice might be towards someone who lives in a specific area of town or has a vastly different income than yourself. Maybe it's their hobbies or where they choose to spend their free time that you judge. Whether they can change a tire or if they know which fork to use at a formal dinner. Prejudice seeps into every single area of our lives without us even realizing. And when you make an assumption about a person, I ask that you question your motives. Is God leading you away from these people? Or is it prejudice? Because in most cases, God wants you to go to them. We speak about the uniting power of faith, but that doesn't mean we remain in the comfort of like-minded people. Unity is about bringing together those who would not normally associate with one another. It's uncomfortable. It makes you push yourself and feel unsafe and out of place. But we can't expect people to leave their comfort zone to find God. We must leave our comfort zone to bring God to everyone. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he told us to make disciples of all nations. All nations is not just about checking off a Christian in every single country. It's about bringing Christ to every single category of people until there are no categories and we are one. In 1948, Penn State played in the Cotton Bowl with Triplett and Hoggart. But the team had to stay at a naval base because no hotels in Dallas would house the entire team. That is the point of the church. God wants a community that houses everyone. God works through us. And if we choose not to associate with certain people, we can't make disciples of all nations. If Christians make judgments about who we think would and would not accept Christ into their lives, we will be failing in our mission. Our job is just to show God's love through our actions to people. It's God's job to judge our hearts. Peter ministered to only the Jewish people because he assumed they were the only ones that were capable of receiving God's grace. 
So God stepped in to make him recognize that he was wrong. That story was put in the Bible because we make that same mistake every single day. God does not show favoritism. We are disciples. Each of us is pure in the eyes of God and we're all created in his image. His grace and love are given to all and we as Christians have this amazing opportunity to share God's love through our actions. So I ask that this week you hold yourself accountable. At school, I certainly have to hold myself accountable for my prejudices. I have to talk to people I wouldn't usually talk to or keep myself from making judgments that I might naturally make. And I just ask that you do the same. As Christians, we should each be working in our own lives to eliminate our prejudices so that it's easier for others to do the same. We should be developing this social norm of love within our church. And we can only do that once we recognize that the church is open to everyone. So I hope you enjoy your week. I do, I, I hope you enjoy your week, but I hope that it's not comfortable. I hope that, I pray that we are stepping out of our comfort zones and working to grow God's kingdom together. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we praise God. We worship the Lord. Before I bring my need, I will bring my heart. Before I lift my cares, I will lift my arms. I want to know you, I want to find you in every season, in every moment. Before I bring my need, I will bring my heart and seek you first I want to seek you I want to seek you first I want to keep you I want to keep you first more than anything I want I want you first before I speak a word let me hear your voice and in the midst of pain let me feel your joy I want to know you I want to find you in every season in every moment before I speak a word I will bring my heart
As disciples of Jesus Christ, we give. Um Corsande, formerly one great hour of sharing, is observed in March. Today, we urge you to give to your local church. We also invite you to the Second Mile Giving, supporting the United Methodist Committee on Relief. As United Methodists, we celebrate that we are a connectional church. In other words, we are better together. Today, we are challenging the Susquehanna United Methodist Conference to share your generosity. As we receive an offering through your local church for UMCOR, United Methodist Community on Relief, let us tell you some information about this important ministry. When disaster strikes around the globe, Haiti's 2010 earthquake, or Typhoon Haiyan in 2013, so much watch the drama unfold on our living room televisions and feel entirely helpless. How could any one person make a difference in the wake of such widespread devastation? As responders around the globe scramble to help survivors, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, or UMCOR, is prepared to act. So, so don't, don't be fooled by the word committee. Since 1940, when UMCOR's foreigner was established to meet the the needs of those suffering overseas, the onset of World War II. We've continued to respond to those in desperate need today throughout more than 80 countries around the world. The response of UMCOR isn't something they do. It's, it's something, something we do. do. When you give, you equip Christ's body to serve in his name. That's because your generous giving to UMCOR Sunday, formerly one great hour of sharing, is what allows UMCOR to act as the arms and legs of Christ's church, moving toward the most vulnerable in their darkest days, convinced that all people have God-given worth and dignity without regard to race, religion, or gender. Together we are assisting those impacted by crisis or chronic need. Because you give the United Methodist Church's compassionate response to human suffering continues today. When tornadoes ripped through Oklahoma, we responded. When children in Zimbabwe lost their parents to AIDS, we responded. When a massive tsunami devastated lives in Japan, we responded. And when the next mass crisis occurs, we will be prepared to respond. UMCOR will be able to offer aid in Jesus' name to those who suffer because United Methodists give through UMCOR Sunday. In fact, it's your generous giving that allows us to respond when disaster strikes. Not they. We. we. Ensure the United Methodist Church can keep helping. Will you continue to give to UMCOR Sunday, formerly One Great Hour of Sharing? Will you continue to meet the needs of the children, families, and communities who've experienced devastation in the wake of disaster? When we meet the needs of those who suffer, we actually minister to Jesus, who said, I was hungry, and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. As we respond, we recognize Jesus in those who are reeling the wake of disaster. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we go forth. We go forth as disciples. We may be leaving a building, we may be leaving a sofa, but we go forth. We don't just leave behind the word, we take it with us. The word transforms us and equips us to serve. The Word gives us the tools and empowers us to touch the lives of others. So that they too may be transformed by the Word that is Jesus Christ. We are disciples. Will you be a disciple too?
such a passion You would not leave us all alone With grace that we could not imagine You called us your own You took the cross for our redemption